put off by how long this video is, don't worry. I tend to jam-pack my videos with as much content, as many details as I possibly can, and I try to talk pretty fast. So while the video is a bit on the long side, I don't repeat myself, and I get into a lot of details about the subject that, you know, pretty much anything that I feel I can comment on and that I think you might find interesting. But hey, if the video is just too long for you to watch, chances are I recorded a shorter version, and the link will be in the description box. It's not an inferior video, it's merely a Cliff's Notes version of this very video. Thief the Dark Project Gold Edition Video Game Review Set in a fictional steampunk world, this has you taking on the role of Garrett, a master thief who learned all his craft from the Keepers, a secretive organization who seek to maintain balance in the world without anyone really noticing their influence. Think Illuminati, basically. And the reason for them trying to maintain balance is that there is this ongoing conflict between the Order of the Hammer, or Hammerites, who basically strive for order and just seek to I guess control is a good term. It's basically, they, they feel that everything can be directed in a, in a positive way. They, they value progress, hence the hammer. The whole, you know, yeah, science. And so, you know, it's not like a typical monotheistic faith. They, they feel that the true value of human, yeah, they, they, they feel that the value of human ingenuity is the greatest strength. And on the other side, the pagans, who, where the hammers represent order, the pagans represent chaos, they are basically the, the mercilessness and unpredictability of nature is what they, their, their philosophy, and, and both have a, a deity. The, the hammers have the benevolent sort of, sort of father figure god, the, the builder who, who, who gave the, the gift of the hammer and chisel onto man. And the pagans worship the trickster who's, you know, yeah, not, not unlike Loki. You really, you can't trust him. And he's just, yeah, ex extremely powerful and you never know what's gonna happen. The, the, the randomness of, of the wild, basically. Now, this is a really clever, basic... I should really finish off the plot before I get into too much into other stuff. So basically, yeah, you're you're Garrett, you're not working for the keepers. You have no stake in this, or you feel like you have no stake in this major conflict. You're just a guy getting by. You, you know, you're a thief. You're you're not the hero. You're not the villain. You're just a guy making his way through. So it's it's quite interesting in that choice of of. Protagonist and and Garrett, by the way, is awesome. He is just constantly snarky. Is the the second level? The, no spoiler. Don't worry. Has you breaking out your fence, and it's not any kind of. Garrett's just like, well, dude's gotta pay me. I just did a job for him. First level is you doing a job for him. Second level, you gotta break him out because who else is gonna pay you? You know, you want to get paid, you're a, you're a thief, so there's just, and constantly, he's, he's really pragmatic, really, really cool, like that. So, so yeah, anyway, Garrett is hired on to do a, a certain job by some mysterious people, and
and I, I can't really say too much more about that, but he, yeah, that, what, what I will say though is that there is indeed a plot. It doesn't seem like it at first. The first several levels, the game doesn't really feel like it, it has a plot, but it very much is. The, you, you're not just taking on a bunch of non-connected missions. You know, the, this doesn't have the, the expansion pack curse of just a bunch of disconnected missions in, in, in a world. Basically, yeah, yeah, it is, it is plot driven, but without the plot taking over, taking charge, you, you aren't really forced into a situation where you, you suddenly can't, or you're suddenly supposed to play it in a different way. That's always, I, I find it's one of the more frustrating things to happen to stealth games when they suddenly have to have something else because obviously if you don't have a plot it can feel a little flat. You know, the end of the game might not have that much of an impact if it hasn't been building up to something, but at the same time, stealth it is about sneaking, and that's less of an active role. So, you know, you have a lot of stealth games that end with just, there at the end, you just gotta fight suddenly, and depending on how much you've been penalized for fighting earlier on, this is, for example, a big problem in the Hitman series, depending on how much you've been penalized for fighting earlier on, it's gonna be especially, you're just, you're gonna have to learn from, you know, completely learn from the bottom up how to fight. So yeah, this does very much have a plot and everything is, everything's connected. But, it doesn't take charge and it's, it's, it's a good story. You, you get into it and, yeah, it, it, the, the first several levels, however, before the plot really takes off, are basically developing the world that you're in. And that's when you find out about the hammers, the, the pagans, and basically how everything works in this world. And that does bring nicely into the, the, the clever nature of this conflict because this is this is a very very clever game they've they've really applied themselves with this one you can tell it's it's looking glass studios who also helped make system shock 2 it's really well crafted everything makes sense basically the you know garrett is just in the middle of this conflict he's not even like, I mentioned before that the keepers are in the middle, he's not even that in the middle, he's like, he's outside of even the middle, basically. You just have this conflict between these two different interpretations of what, different philosophical leanings. And the player is not forced to fight for or against these, basically, you're, you're not made to make any any value judgments, you can make up your own mind about them, and really it's, the, the, you know, the, the more you look at both of them, there is clearly good and bad to both. The, the, the you know, the science is a fantastic thing, but at the same time, if it's science to the, you know, if, if there is no kind of ethical barrier if, if you just keep going with progress. You know, you have s things like pollution and the like. And at the same time, on the other, you know, on the other hand, nature is, you know, we have to, yeah, again, pollution, we have to be careful not to ruin nature, but if you, you know, the, Science can really improve people's lives, and, and certainty is an important factor of a, a healthy 
psyche, really, you know, childhood development is for one thing, but also just adulthood, you know, when, when you look at how people behave when they feel that the people in power are fair and just versus if they are constantly just afraid of them and they feel that they're corrupt. And so, so you can't have completely random and loose like that either. And yeah, it's, it's a very well set up conflict. And it's, yeah. And, and again, you know, the System Shock 2 also has a really ingenious conflict. I'm not gonna obsess over System Shock 2 in this review, don't worry. I already did a video doing so, at least one. So anyway, other really well-crafted things. I should really preface the following by saying this is a highly influential game, and that's why people are still playing it today. I, I literally, I got it on Steam, you know, on a sale, and I can totally see why people would actually, you know, still be selling it, still be buying it. it you can still see the impact this game has had. And th this was one of the first really all-out stealth games, and one of the really... one of the ones that really didn't kind of... take any kind of... what do you say? Yeah, it, it took no prisoners. It just went straight for stealth. And has thus, you know, and, and with the the first person perspective and and the 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 control of only one character and such, it has, you know, the, this is the reason that games like that that franchises like Hitman and Splinter Cell exist. And it also, you know, it, it came out around the same time as the, the original Commando, so you know, and it actually is. Yeah, the, the, the challenge level in the two, it's been a while since I've played Commandos, but they're fairly equal in, in challenge level. Anyway, the... There are so many things. I guess I, I'll start with the... How you use the stealth. Basically, this was, I believe, the first game to employ sound and shadow as a means of stealth. Basically, excuse me, if there is, um, the less light there is on you, the less likely you are to be seen. In fact, if you are completely in the darkness, and there's a fancy light meter to, fancy, there's an, a, a very useful light meter to let you know, and that's really good because at times you might think that where you are moving towards is in shadow, but then when you get there, it apparently isn't, so yeah, it's, it's really good that they did that. The, yeah, the, the less light there is on you, the less likely you are to be seen. If you are in complete darkness, they can't see you if they haven't already seen you. They can't spot you. They can bump into you if you are standing in the, you know, guard patrol path. But other than that, they cannot see you. And I cannot describe with mere words the sheer glee of standing just a few inches away from a guard passing by, or a servant for that matter. Those are really the, the two types of NPCs you'll encounter, really. The servants won't fight, they'll call the guards, the guards will fight, so yeah. And just they have them pass by just like that, and they just don't notice you at all. And if they if they happen to be carrying anything, you know, you might just nick that just from right right out of their their belt or whatever. Yes, pre prepare for a package preposterously packed with pickpocketing. Got a lot of alliteration. And. So, so yes, that, that quite covers the, the, the shadow light side. Actually, I should 
On the other end of the spectrum, you of course, if you are in complete light, people will notice you. And the entire game takes place at night. You are always roaming around because you are a thief, you know, and you and you're you know, you use shadows, so wherever you are, if you get noticed, you're probably gonna be in trouble. You're, you're not supposed to be there. You know, you already are inside someone's mansion or the like. And if someone spots you, yeah, that's, that's it, the, you know, alarm. And <laughs> given that it is nighttime, these guys, these guards, they're only there to try to notice you. They're not, they're not like, busy with other stuff and they might happen to know. They're, they're hired specifically to listen and keep their eyes open. So they're gonna notice. They might not immediately know that it's you. One example is that if you... I should, I should go more into the sound before I... But basically, yeah. If, if you get noticed, that's, that's it. There, there is no, like... There, there's no social stealth in the, well, technically, there's essentially no social stealth in this. And it, so, so yeah, you're always hiding from them. And yes, the, the sound side of that is that anything you walk on, the speed with which you walk on it, and the the distance between you and the guard who might hear, or guards, determines how likely you are to get heard. If you're on a carpet, go nuts, run, jump, they're not going to hear you. Wood might creak, you know, it's, it's, it'll, it'll give a little bit, they'll hear that, and they know that there's not supposed to be anyone. Stone, that's getting a bit more risky, you know, makes, makes a bit of a noise, and that, that sound travels more than, than, like, that of just wood. And finally, I guess, I guess it's like marble, and yeah, you know, some, some fancy places, marble floors, or the like, that is really going to give you away. You, you want to crouch down and slow to a crawl on your speed. You have like three speeds. You can walk, and then there's one button for slowing you down, and then there's a third button for running. And yeah, you, you will need to run at times, so make running jumps and the like. And the... So, so yeah, the... the Basically, you can use the sound, you know, you can use, you can distract them with sounds. You can pick up objects, you know, maybe you're just, you find the kitchen and you pick up, like, a pot. Throw that onto some stone or something, that's going to make a noise, you know. And, and there again, you have, if you, however, throw it on, like, the carpet, they're not going to notice that at all, pretty much. And they, uh, by the way, they will also investigate open doors. They're like, this isn't supposed to be open. And, yeah, so you'll, you'll want... This might also... I can't think of another game offhand that has... Well, a few, but they're all inspired by this. That literally had me take care to open the door facing away from me, not the door facing towards me when I was opening, opening a set of, you know, double doors whilst sneaking because literally if I open the one that opens towards me, that lets out, you know, there, there's a light source and so, yeah, I get noticed. But if I open the one that opens away from me, nothing really gets... It's a little difficult to explain without the visual. What I'm saying is, this game is tense like you wouldn't believe, and it really makes you apply yourself. I should also say, if you, if you aren't patient 
And if you don't love stuff with a passion, do not apply. Simply, and that's, I don't mean that as an insult. I myself don't have the most amount of patience, but it's, it's not the game for you, and it was never meant to be. This is for the people who just love to sneak great distances, and I will admit, at times the sneaking gets a little repetitive. But I will, it, it's, it's incredible how much that doesn't happen though. You, you would think that it would happen way more. And it's a lot because of how clever the setup of the, the, sight, the, the light and the sound and then the tools you get to use, which I will get into detail with. However, part of the genius of the, the, the amount of light and, and sound, and this is something that I don't, that I, I haven't seen all games use. That, that's one thing that, you know, that, that I haven't seen all games inspired by this use. In fact, fairly few of them. And that's why this game still, it hasn't particularly been top. Now, keep in mind, I've only played the first one for now, but I understand why people are still playing this. It's not just, it's not nostalgia. It's not, oh, I want to see where all this cool stuff came from. No, there's real reason. It's like with Prince of Persia from 89. It's not just the fact that it inspired these, you know, this completely new direction. It's actually a really great game. One thing that, yeah, the, the, the sheer genius of, the, of using light and shadow, light and sound, is that you and the NPCs use it to detect each other. You don't have one of these fancy radars or, you know, maps that show enemies or the like in this game. You have maps, I'll get more into that. So, when you're trying to avoid being spotted by one of these, once again, very aware guards, and you want to know if you can move through this hallway or if you should stay in this little room that you've hid in well, listen for sounds of... because you can hear their footsteps, and you can see them from distance, and again, the more light there is, some enemies are actually hidden in quite a lot of darkness. It's, it's more the sound that lets you know where they are, but again, it's, it's a fantastic idea because you are not only, you know, you, you want to avoid them, so you listen for them, and they're of course, you know, they, they don't think about not making noises because they're not trying to hide from anyone. And literally, you know, I already mentioned that, you know, patrolling guards will make noise from what they're walking on, which also means that if they happen to be walking on a carpet, you might not hear them. So, you're always so aware of your surroundings, and let's, let's contrast, for example, the, the, like I said, carpet wood, all this stuff, how much noise that makes with these big boxes that just scream, please hide a body in me, in, you know, Hitman Blood Money. They do a better job of making these seem organic in absolution. In Blood Money, it's just, it's extremely clear that what, what they're used for, and you, you wonder, like, is there really a human body-sized box in this particular area, you know, and in this, that never happens. You're never like, would they really have a fancy long carpet in the hallway of a mansion? Yeah, they would. They're, they're you know, they're rich, they're, they're showing off, so yeah, they have, and at the same time, of course, a lot of, like, the stairs might be just made of stone, and, you know, they might have some wooden buildings in there, and, so it all, it all makes sense, and you, you're always aware of it, but it doesn't feel like it's screaming out. The, the, the less a game reminds you that it's a game, the more you really immerse yourself in it. 
the, the less of these big shiny mid-air icons you know that say hey you can talk to this person you can pick this item up the less you forget that it isn't real and that's something this game does immensely well you, you really just dive right into it and yeah now the the basic setup is that you're always you always have to sneak into somewhere you're always like just on the very outskirts of like a mansion or like I mentioned a prison you know it, it has a nicely varied you know there are some nicely varied settings you know you you've got the yeah in, in addition to some mansions and a prison you, you know you go to a gravesite or two you you rob some ruins and Admittedly, at times, this does get somewhat Tomb Raider-y with, with traps and, yeah, you know, ancient ruins and such. It doesn't do it poorly, so there's that, but it's obviously not the most, not the most original. You know, the, Tomb Raider it was just starting around this time as well, so, yeah, it's, it's a little bit... And you could also argue that it's not really what you expect from a game called Thief as the, the primary title. And I was also say this one does get a bit lost in the supernatural aspects with less just, you know, sneaking around and, you know, stealing from big mansions and the like. I am told that the second one fixes that. So, yeah. Now, the... Yes, you, you get into where you have to go, you find and steal something specific, and sometimes it's not stealing, sometimes it, it can be other things, and then you get back out safely, preferably without having been noticed. Now, the objectives are actually quite nicely varied. Like I said, it's surprising how little this gets repetitive. I mean, when, when you have stuff, you really gotta keep things interesting. You'll, you'll want to make sure that it's, it's again, it's not a very active part. If, if you, if you're playing an action game, you're running around gunning people down, or you're, you know, blowing stuff up, that's fun. That keeps being fun for a long time. That's, that's not really gonna run out of, because you're, you're taking a very active part in a, a very, in a very clear conflict, and that's that's easy to get into. But sneaking around, stealing, it, it can be fun, but you wouldn't think it would be able to last. And again, stealth, if you, as long as you have a good concept, you know, splinter yourself, sneak into somewhere, steal some like top secret files, get out without anyone ever having known, you know, save the world without anyone ever knowing. You know, Hitman, go kill this person without anyone noticing. You know, blow up his car, snipe him from a hundred yards away. But a thief, so they're, they, they were very, very smart with thinking up some really nice different objectives. Again, like I already mentioned somewhat, the second level literally has you breaking into a prison, you know, waving high to... Crap, the, the, the Wentworth Miller on the way in and breaking out someone. You know, you're not, you know, stealing something fancy. You're literally breaking into a prison to get someone else out. And that's... And, and the game just grabs you like that. It, it really just... Yeah, they... they it's, it's always sneaking, but it's, it can be some very varied things you're, you're supposed to do. I refuse to give more examples because of, of that because it is just too good to spoil. And in fact, in general, the game really subverts your expectations a lot of times. I've already, I've already spoiled as much of that as I'm going to. The, the fact that it gets quite supernatural in spite of the whole thief thing and the, the yeah, suddenly breaking out someone from, from prison. 
it just, you, you never know where the game's gonna go. And there are a few times where this doesn't work out perfectly, but usually you really, you just run with it. The game never really has you just stopping and going, well, what the heck now? It's always just, yeah, you, you, you run with it. It's, it's really, yeah, I, I, if, if someone, if, if you're going to be playing this, do not read about, like, the plot in detail. Do not get into, in, I, just don't let anyone spoil it for you. Just go into it and, yeah, if, in fact, if anyone actually tells you everything that there is in this game, you probably won't even believe them. You'll, you'll have to play for yourself and then afterwards be like, wow, that was in there. How did they fit that in there? They, and somehow it just all makes sense. It's, it's really impressive. They, they, there is a wealth of creative ideas in this game that just all fit within this steampunk world that they've created. There, there is some magic, there is some 19th century technology. The hammers, they literally do manufacture hammers. Yeah, it, among other things, you know, and, and you can actually go and, and, you, in the prison you come by some of these machines and you can craft a hammer if you want, you know, and you, you can pick it up and throw it as a, you know, to create a noise distraction. Yeah, the game is incredibly interactive. That's another thing that really... Yeah, th this is one of the first games where the world was truly alive. Where just things are happening. You know, you, you pass through this factory on the way to the prison in that second level. And yeah, you know, you, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to you know, interact with these machines or do anything about the people running these machines. You can just sit there and watch and literally the NPC will produce a hammer, you know, and, and go and set up the machine, produce another hammer, and, and just... And, and you too can go and produce the hammer. You can turn on the alarm if you want in some areas, if, you know, if there's like an alarm button. And you can also very clearly tell, you know, okay, I should keep them away from that because that's the alarm, you know. It, it feels very organic. And this, some of the enemies actually feel so alive that I literally felt bad about killing them. The, there, there's this animal that you come across that it, if you, if you, when you kill it, if you choose to kill it, basically you're not really s supposed to kill any one human, but there are other things. And yeah, I'll, I'll get more into that, but if, if you choose to kill it, you'll hear this just horrifying death scream. And they will, and it'll literally try to flee if it gets hurt. And any enemy in this will try to flee if they're, you know, hurt. And yeah, it you you really get a sense of them being alive. In fact, some some of the NPCs, if they're from different like factions or the like, if they're not allies, they might fight. I, I literally, I, there was this level where I was supposed to get into a, yeah, I was supposed to break into somewhere, and the place I was breaking into wasn't exactly legal. Now, there was a patrolling guard, like, a, like an actual policeman, you know, the actual authorities, just walking around on the outside, so I waited for him to be a little away, and I had to pick the lock, I'll get more into that. And the moment I had picked the lock, someone from inside the house saw that the door was open. He didn't see me, he just saw the door opening. And I heard him react so very quickly. I, actually, I think I accidentally missed mentioning that. Guards that are just standing still, they don't like hum or clear their throat. 
mumble to themselves. You know, some guards also carry out conversations, and if you listen to these, you learn more about the world. There will also be documents that you can read that will tell you about the world, and cutscenes. But anyway, yeah, so the, he noticed, so I very quickly hid in the shadows, very, very silently, and literally, the guy from inside the house ran out and killed the patrolling guard because he couldn't see me. He just saw an open door and there was the guard. And so they, they started, you know, fighting and he managed to kill the guard. And that's literally, you know, the, the enemy AI pieced together, well, somebody did this. I see that guy, so he must be the one. And yeah, you know, it makes sense because he's not, you know, he's a bit of an unsavory type, this person in the house. So, yeah, it, like, it, like I said, it just, it's alive and you can affect things that the game makers didn't necessarily intend for you to do. There was also a point where I was trying to flee from these animals, these land-based animals, and I jumped into water because Gareth can swim. And I wasn't really thinking about what would happen if they... I was just trying to get away from these land-based animals. They kept running, so they came into the water with me. And I was trying to swim away from them. And then I noticed after like 30 seconds that they weren't following me. So I turn around and I see that they've drowned. So literally, it's not that water means death to these land animals. Because that's not... you know, it's not poisonous. You know, if Gary can swim in it, it's... yeah. But they can't breathe underwater, and they couldn't swim like Garrett could. So they couldn't, like I, just swam up to the surface and got more air. So when they ran out of air, they drowned. And this wasn't like how I was supposed to kill these. It was just, you know, I was almost just playing around, you know. Just, I didn't really feel like turning around to fight them. I wanted to run, and so, yeah, that's what happened. And... To, to flesh that out more, the game has a proper physics engine. Now, it's not flawless, but just think about that for a second, that, that in, in games today, we take for granted these, you know, proper physics, but this is actually one of the first games that literally put that in there. You know, if, if you pick something, like, like I said, if you throw something, it will make the noise that it will, that, you know, that it should. You can use, you know, if you, you have specialized arrows, yeah, you're basically a Hawkeye. You can use water arrows, for serious, to turn out, you know, if, if like, if a torch is the light source or a fireplace, you can put out that fire and create more shadow. And, you know, you can also do this without, yeah, you, you can, I think you can pretty much turn out any fire you come across in the game. And, you know, I, I read that you can also set fire to wooden items and the like. I honestly couldn't get that to work, but, um, but, but yeah, you literally, you know, do what you want. It's, it's an open world. And that brings me back to how the, basically, the game doesn't really force you to do much of anything. You have specific objectives. You, you have to get in, you have to steal something, you have to get back out. You know, you, you, you can't die and then still win, obviously. But, you know, on, on the higher difficulty settings, some of the levels also say, you know, don't kill anyone. That's, in fact, briefly on the difficulty settings, there's basically three difficulty settings, and the more, the, the higher the difficulty setting, the more objectives you'll have to accomplish, and thus, the tougher it'll be. And in addition to that, it's also just highly replayable, because you literally, you can approach it in, in very much the way you want to. You, you're given certain tools and you choose how to solve the different, you know, g getting in somewhere and stealing something and then getting out safely, does that mean 
sneaking past everyone, never getting seen, never, you know, yeah, not, not really leaving any trace, not, not knocking anyone out, for example, not killing anyone. It could. Or, you can, you, you're, you're kind of going to have to Rambo First Blood it somewhat, you know, use guerrilla tactics, take them, you know, lure them away from their, from where the other guards can tell, and, you know, take them out one by one, but you can actually take out a lot of the ends. I didn't try to take out absolutely everyone, but it definitely seemed like I could. You know, in the first Hitman game, you, you aren't allowed to kill very many, you know, very many people other than your targets. And in that game it makes sense. You're a hitman, they expect you to be precise. You're a, you're a surgeon, you're not an explosive device. They send you in to be invisible. They send you in because you don't exist. Uh, yeah, sorry. Anyway, in that, they literally, you know, if you complete a level but you've killed a lot of people, they'll say, you're not really, you know, it's not you, it's me, and it's all those dead guys. Go away, I'll find someone else. In this game, that never happens. At the end of a level, you'll be told the stats of that level and of the entire game. And you can see, like, you know, damage taken, damage dealt, you know, innocents killed, others killed, stuff like this. It doesn't, there's, there's no, like, point system. There's no penalty. To, to kill. Again, as long as it doesn't counter your objectives, it's really up to you and yeah, how, how much you want to, you know, yeah, what, what is this thievery to you? Do, do you want to knock out every single guard, you know? Yeah, what, what exactly? How, how exactly do you want to approach it? And basically summing that up is that you the amount of effort you put into the game is the amount of enjoyment that you get out of the game. And I feel that's as it should be. I, I personally feel that a game should basically just... Well, almost everything in life should... should that the amount of... Yeah, that, that there should be a, a correspondence there. A, yeah, that... that so if if you want, you can. Spend, you know, I mean, this this game. I tried, to, you know, especially early on, to find like all the the treasure and stuff. The game took me 33, 34 hours to complete, with fifteen levels total. Because it's gold version, it includes three other levels. All otherwise, it's just twelve and thirteen in-game hours and thirty-four real-life hours. And if you want, you could probably do it a lot faster. You could probably also do it slower. It, it really depends on how much you want to immerse yourself. And also, like I said, the world is alive. It's at night, but that doesn't mean that nothing else at all is going on other than these patrolling guards. You, you might come across other things going on, and it, yeah, it's, it's just, it's it's interesting how, because they clearly put effort into every single little detail and everywhere you can, you can see the, how, how this world is. You know, there, there's, like, I already mentioned the, the you know, Trickster is the, the, basically the, the pagan god, and he's this, you know, unpredictable kind of there's there's a line that you know one of the servant NPCs in the game tells another servant NPC like you know if, if you you know if you happen to be in this place you know that, that they have to run away really fast if you know if someone sounds like they're angry something like that and he literally says run as if the trickster was chasing you and it's just it's this completely it's this tiny detail that you might not even really notice or think about, but it, yeah, it, it just, it shows how they, they just everywhere 
you have this 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 world that they've created and that they clearly put a ton of thought into it it makes sense there's there's nothing in this world that feels like it shouldn't be there no matter how insane it might seem when you first see it and i literally mean that as with the subverting expectations anyway the so yeah, you, you approach it how you want, you know, do you want all the treasure? The treasure is going to be what you use to buy more equipment for, you know, future missions with. So if you want a lot of equipment, you're going to have to get treasure, and the treasure is not necessarily an objective. Sometimes you're told to get at least so and so much, but yeah, how, how much do you want to be able to buy for the next mission? And... You know, and and yeah, if if you don't really care about buying equipment for the next mission, then sure, just go, you know, try to find the the exact objective as quickly as possible, get it, and get back out. Now, I should talk some about the quickly interject that you can save and load at any point in this game. There's no kind of limitation on that. And you can always, if you, every mission is preceded by a briefing video which has Garrett narrate basically how he expects it to go or what the, what the nature of the, you know, am I going into a mansion? Am I going into a prison? What am I doing here? What can I expect, basically? You can, you know, when, when you get to the shop, you there, there's literally a button that says re, replay briefing or something like that. And yeah, you know, you'll be like, well, did, am I going to need this equipment? Well, let's just get the briefing again. And you can always restart any of the missions. And when you restart, you again get that briefing. So if you, you know, if you forgot something, you can always just save where you are, Press restart, get the mission briefing again, and load your progress again. So, yeah. Now, the... Basically, the, the level design is incredibly organic. Every level feels like it, it exists in real life. It feels like you are walking around, for example, a prison or a mansion. The... In, in the prison, for example, there is this, you, know, you have to go a bit of, of distance before you get to the actual prison. And it's basically like, it's a building, but it's not just on the outside. It's, it's kind of, you know, think, think fortress, you know. Slightly less Christopher Lambert, though. Basically, it's, it's somewhat underground. And on the way there, you know, you, you might pass this, there's, there's some, some war, and once I got into the prison itself, there was literally this place that, again, had some water, and I could tell, you know, it ended in a waterfall, so I jumped in, let myself be taken by the stream, went down the waterfall, and none of this hurt me or anything, and when I got down there, I looked around and I realized, this is that patch of water where I was earlier. Now, fortunately, I had saved, so I could just load, but literally, it didn't hurt me. It might just force me to sneak some more, but literally, you know, I, I was in that patch early, and I looked at the water, I, I saw the waterfall, and then later I could actually come down that waterfall. Every area, every level is connected. You know how you, you might be playing a video game and you're going around the level and you're like, look up, and you're like, wow, that, you know, there's 30 feet in the air, there's this long hallway. It, it would be pretty cool if I could walk on the inside of that, you know, or, or you're in a castle and you look down and there's like, you know, there, there's a bridge and there's some water and you're like, wow, I, I it, would, it would be pretty cool to just dive right in and swim, you know, see if that leads anywhere interesting. And 
in this game you can. You, you, it, it might not always be so easy and so direct, but you can almost always go kind of everywhere. I, I, I don't think there was ever an area where I looked and I was like, that might be fun to, to go there at some point. And I couldn't some way get there. You know, it might take a while, might not have a completely direct path, but yeah, and, and so again, it's up to the player. Do you want to go for the direct path? Keeping in mind that the direct path, you know, the cards aren't stupid. They know where to stand. They know where, it, where there is a direct path, so they're going to be blocking that path, especially. Or do you want to find this more out of the way and sneak for, you know, go go a longer distance, but maybe encounter fewer guards. You know, you always have this choice. And whilst it can be very, you know, it, it can be very, very difficult if you don't play it sneaky, I would say. Because you're really not, you're a thief, you're not a guard. You know, the, the people you're up against, they've got armor. They, they were trained with their swords. You're kind of, you, you got a sword, but you're not a fighter. You're not exactly a lover either. You're, you're a stealer. But it's basically possible to not completely, you know, sneak around all the time. And the game almost never forces you to not sneak. You, you know, you, you know, alternatively, you can run a fight, but the game almost never forces you directly into that. There's almost always a way to sneak, even if it seems impossible, even if you're like, but there's a million of them, they've got intersecting patrol, don't worry, that doesn't happen right away, the patrol paths, this is impossible, there's light everywhere, if, if you really apply yourself, and again, if, yeah, if, if you really apply yourself, you'll really get that enjoyment out of it. And at the same time, if you're just like, can I just kind of fight them, maybe lure them away, something, that's quite possible as well. Now, I've already teased some about the equipment, which, again, very much helps keep the sneaking from being just extremely repetitive. It's not just, you know walking on, you know, it's not just about finding carpets to, to run on, or, you know, finding shadow. I already mentioned you can make more shadow by putting out torches, but at the same time, you can't turn off every single light. Some of them are, like, electrical, and there aren't switches, so, you know, yeah, you, you can't necessarily affect the light. In addition to that, basically, you have a bunch of specialized excuse me, arrows. I'm not going to give all of them away, but in addition to water, you also have a moss arrow, which basically explodes into these little patches of moss. And moss is not that noisy to walk on, and literally, no matter what surface that lands on, as long as you stick to these patches of moss, that's, you know, that won't make noise. You might still be able to be seen, so you still have to, you know, Keep that in mind. You know, you've got these fire arrows, which are really just miniature rockets. It's, it's, yeah, but, so yeah, clearly they do still have a sense of fun. It's not just about sneaking. I'm not sure I should give too much other, I gotta mention just one more of these, of these arrows. The rope arrow, which is just as awesome as it sounds. You can literally attach a rope to any wooden surface, which again makes sense. If you shoot into stone, it's, it's an arrow. It's an arrowhead. It's not gonna stick to stone, but wood, it'll, you know, a rope comes out and you can use that and you can climb up. Like, you, you, you can climb onto a balcony, for example. If you're just out in, in the garden, you can see, oh, there's a balcony. It's made of, you know, the, the what's it called? Stuff you hold on to, you know. It's made of wood. Well, okay, fire an arrow into it, climb that rope, and mantle onto the... Uh, yeah, that, that's...
that just I love that and and yes mantling again like in System Shock 2 it's used a lot more here than it is in System Shock 2 but it's a great feature basically you just you jump and you hold down the jump button and if you hit like something that you could realistically grab onto you know it has to be a straight surface for example and you can't like you can't grab up on here, you know, you have to land here. So again, it's first person perspective, so you can always tell if you, you know. And he will just climb up and, yeah. And you can even grab this rope arrow after you've climbed up or down. Well, not down, obviously, but if you climb, if you climb up it, you can grab the arrow and you can use it again. Yeah, it's, it's, really think grappling hook and it's literally yeah and and they use it really well it, it even just even if you are like okay with stealth but you think the idea of using a grappling hook in a video game is freaking awesome play this game you will not be disappointed at least for the the, the rope arrow there's also also a noise arrow which yeah, creates a noise distraction, and the great thing about this is, you know, like I said, you can pick up a pot and you can throw that somewhere, but depending on what it hits and how far away the guard is, you might not be able to use it as well. You're only a human, you know, you can't throw it that far, you know, you can throw it, I don't know, 10 feet or something, but Garrett's just a human being, you know, he's really good at sneaking, but he is a human being. But the arrow, you know, yeah, you can fire that as, as far as a, a normal arrow, so you can fire that consistently longer. I also really like how they use the, the bow. Basically, it's, it's almost like a sniper. You have the, the sights, so you can tell. I will say, I really wish that it was easier to tell when using water arrows if you were aiming the right place because you can shoot a, several water arrows over a torch without it turning off the torch and I really couldn't tell what I was doing wrong but that really is it's it's pretty much the only thing I never had any trouble with the rope arrows or yeah or the other arrows for that matter but yeah I, I, I do wish that they did slightly better but with the water arrows that's really it you literally see, you know, the, the bow comes up and you literally see how you, what's it called? T tighten it, yeah, I'm sorry, I don't talk about archery in English all that often. And the longer you hold down the button, keeping in mind, you're, you can't be running around while you're doing this, so you want to be standing somewhere where you can keep standing. The longer you hold it down, until a certain limit, the more the, the the kind of sight thing will zoom in and the further the arrow will go. So if you just, you know, I already mentioned sometimes you might be running or fighting. If you're running away from a, from a quick enemy and you don't have a head start, if you turn around and try to like fire an arrow at him, you're probably not going to be able to tighten the, the string before he gets within range and attacks. So it's it's again it's a stealth weapon. You can you can use the bow as often as you like, but if you try to use it at someone who's running at you, or if you're standing somewhere where you'll be spotted before you fire the arrow, you know. So you you're, you're always thinking about how to make these tools work for you. In addition, you have several other really fun tools. You have your typical the, the potions, you know, you, you've got a health potion, you've got a breath potion, which I think is really just a little, you know, a little bit of extra air. It's for when you're swimming and if you can't get to a pocket of air in time, so yeah. And you have a speed potion, so yeah. And all of these, you know, work for a limited time. The health potion isn't going to keep working infinitely, and to also keep in mind I've already mentioned you take damage much easier than enemies do. The health potion works slowly, so even if you have several, you're not going to want to just run in and start fencing with everyone. 
you also have these mines, which, yeah, the proximity mines speak for themselves, and these flashbangs, which also yeah, speak for themselves. And again, you know, think about it. The, one of the first proper stealth games, one of the first proper, I will sneak past everyone and no one will notice me, and it already had a flashbang. It's just, yeah. And the earlier alluded to lock picks. Now, lock picking has been done in a lot of stealth games. This is one of the more simplistic ways, but it's also a great way to do it. A lot of things in this game are very just, you know, pick it up and play. You, you don't have to learn a bunch of stuff. You can, you know, do you know how to control a character in a first-person shooter-y interface? Well, you can play this game, basically. You know, you, you fire the bow the same way you fire a normal weapon in one of those, and yeah, you, you can strafe, you can crouch, you can jump. There's not a lot to learn, which again makes it really fun and immersive. You're, you're not spending a lot of, you know, the game opens with this very short training scene. Well, very short. It's, it's, it's of an adequate length. It's not terribly long, and yeah, you, you learn you learn about the, the light, and you learn about the sound, and then it teaches you a little about, you know, you, you get some archery training, because that does take some ten years, too. And, you know, they teach you about rope climbing, which also is, you know... I will also say, sometimes the rope bugs out a little bit. There, there are a few bugs and glitches in this game, but nothing really big. But, but yeah, the ropes can sometimes... Make sure you save if you gotta make like a really daring attempt at escape using, you know, rope, because sometimes it won't grab on properly or something. Yeah, I, it's difficult to explain, but if you've played it, you know, unless it's just the, the yeah, the version I played, I don't know exactly, but anyway. Yeah, the, you, you just, you, you get right into it. it it's challenging. But it's not challenging because you're spending the first several hours of gameplay just trying to learn how to do things. Because that's always the most boring part of the game. You want to get into it. You want to get good at it and you want to have fun with it. And here, literally, lockpicking. There are two lockpicks. One of them is... And, and yeah, and, and sometimes you, you know... Yeah, I think it's triangle and square, yeah, if, if you use the triangle, if you have to use the triangle, you won't be able to use the square right then and there, and vice versa, and sometimes you might have to switch back and forth between them, and using them, literally, you just, you go over to the door, you select in your memory, and you hold down the right mouse button, which is always your use button, and yeah, you can hear him, you know, pick the lock, you can see the, the little, what's it called, handle moving, if, you, if the sound stop and the handle stops moving, that means you can no longer pick this. If it never stop, starts, then it's because you can't pick that lock, you need a key. And if, yeah, if it stops, switch to the other lock pick and then keep going. And sometimes you've got to switch back and forth several times. Now this is, like I said, it's very easy to get into. Anyone can do this. But you might be, you know, you might be forced to stand in light where you know there are patrolling guards, so you have to time it right. Or, you know, there, there are various different ways they make this more tense. And, and again, keep in mind, an open door might attract a guard's attention. You know, so, and, and the door opens automatically once you pick the lock completely, so, yeah. And, yeah, that's, that's, the that's the essence of the lock picking and no matter how far you get in picking the lock you can always start right there like i mentioned patrolling guards you're in the light suddenly you are aware they're too close okay so you you know stop lock picking hide in the shadows wait for you know 30 seconds for the guards to pass completely go back you don't have to start over like you do in most more recent lock-picking mechanisms in stealth games. Here you just, you continue from where you got to. 
and the locks in general. I already mentioned how it's so, the world is alive. If you pick up a key, there was one point where I picked up a key, I, I pickpocketed a key from a guard, and he moved, he, he kind of ran into it, or that was, it, at times the, there are, you know, these slightly awkward AI bugs, uh, you know, foes also can't climb ladders, so they'll just be standing there like, uh, and, uh, yeah, and in general, there are a couple of places where they maybe can't follow you, and so they just kind of stand there, yeah, but, yeah, he literally, he just, he couldn't figure out the door, so I snuck over and I unlocked the door, and he passed through it. And then I could literally, you can also lock a door if you want, and, and someone, you know, say, say you, you, you have to get into somewhere specific and you need a key. Open the door with the key, you know, unlock it, close the door, and then lock the door again. You can make noise in there. If a guard comes by who doesn't have the key to that door, he won't be able to unlock it. So it, it literally is this just amazing... Yeah, they, they really did incredibly well. I, I should also mention, I don't remember if I mentioned the... Yeah, the physics engine isn't perfect. If you, for example, throw a noise-making item like into an enemy or something, it might just go through him or something, you know, it won't like hurt him and he might not even notice it, especially if it doesn't make noise, so not perfect, but yeah. And I suppose that more or less covers the equipment aspect. It brings me nicely into just the, the user interface in general. This is one of these, you know, first person perspective things where, you know, you've got to use something. Again, like I said, you don't really want the big, you know, glowy thing above it to, to let you know when you can use something that's, you know, distracting. In this game, you know, where System Shock 2, for example, has a, you know, sort of, yes, an, an, an indicator. And that's because the, the, the in-game HUD is literally the, the computer that they put in the player character's brain, you know, goggles. Yeah, he has no name and that's what people call them. Yeah, so in that it makes sense, but here, you know, you don't have anything like that. So, basically, you, you have to have something in the center of the screen and it'll, it'll brighten slightly and that means you can use it and, you know, this doesn't mean necessarily that it's, you know, like if you're trying to open a door that's locked, it'll still get, you know, blowy, but you just, you won't be able to open the door. But that's how you interact with everything. That's also how you pick up items. You know, center of the screen, it's, it lights up, right click, and there it is in the inventory, you know, so. It's, it's very, very cleverly done. And using from your inventory is also just, you know, selected in the inventory, you know, face the thing, keep it in the center of the screen that you want to use the item in question on and right click and that's it. And so also sometimes you'll want to make sure not to have an item readied in your inventory but there's there's a close inventory button so just make friends with that. Also make friends with the compass and the map. That's also, that's another thing. If you're not really comfortable reading maps and games you probably don't really want to play this game. I'm not the best at it myself, and yeah, it, it's been a while since I really used it much. And in this, you know, I already mentioned there will be several paths. So if you, you know, you can go where you're not supposed to, where you won't necessarily get anything out of going. So you don't really want to get too used to just trying out different paths in this game. You'll want to make good friends with that map and that compass. And be grateful for the detailed maps when you have them. Because the further along in the game, the less detail they get. The, the, the more vague and outdated they become. Because, like I said, you go to ruins, you go to, you know, graveyards. People don't, you know, update these. You'll find out why these maps aren't updated. There's always an explanation. 
it's, it's often that people don't go here anymore and you'll find out why. And yeah, and, and sometimes admittedly the game does, you know, you, you kind of just end up having to try out different paths. I personally find that a stealth game shouldn't be difficult because you're trying to find your way. I find that the focus should be on sneaking, but in this game it literally is so much that yeah, you, you, the focus is on sneaking. If, if you read the map properly and you apply you know, critical thinking like you, well, you will probably have it in this particular chamber, or well, the guard said something about it being on that floor, and from that you can figure out how to approach it, but yeah, you will very much have. Did I mention that the compass is in your inventory, which means if you're like if you're picking a lock, for example, your compass is you know off screen, and, or if you have picked up an item, if you have your hands full, you also can't check your compass. So yeah, and you can't check your map with you know there, there's no like mini map. You you bring up the entire map, and it might just tell you well you're in this basic area, you know and. Yeah, make friends with the compass and remember that up is north on the maps, so yeah. Now, the, the, the game is incredibly realistic. Everything, you know, like I said, there are a few things where they didn't do it absolutely perfectly. It's perfectly forgivable for the time, as is the, the graphics, which... They're, they're obviously outdated today, but I will also say they, they were okay when the game came out. They weren't really... This came out around the same time as like Half-Life. This doesn't really live quite up to that. There are some very awkward, angular shapes in level design sometimes and the, and the like, but, you know, I, uh, so, so yeah. And the 3D also very much doesn't quite hold up anymore. But but yes, the for for the time the the physics engine is really really good. Now the 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 game is chock full of atmosphere. There's seldom score in the actual levels. It's it's a very quiet game, full of ambient sounds so where you know if you're in a garden you'll you'll hear like crickets and there's there's this one creepy bit I just I have to reference you literally hear you hear this infant crying and and you just it's it's not like you're in a hospital with the the, the maternity ward no there's there's no reason why you should be hearing this and there's also this creepy secretive laughter almost mocking laughter, and it's just like, where is this coming from? There's no reason this should be here, and it just, it's just for atmosphere, and it's so effective. With some old school puzzles, and having to use the map, having to apply yourself, and this atmosphere, in some ways, I compare this to old school Silent Hill. It's, it's not as consistently, like, horrifying Silent Hill, but it's not trying to be. This is really, this is a full world. Silent Hill is a slice of just, yeah, a, a terrifying dimension that you do not want to be near. This is a, a world, it, like I said, it's set entirely at night, but not everything is creepy and, you know, the, the mansions are just, you know, fancy and, and nice, you know. Now, the, the voice acting of the characters, at least, is great. Garrett, especially, and, and other characters, yeah, you, they're real personality and they're very memorable characters. Now, the, the reason I say of the characters and not of everyone, some of the guards and innocents, you know, various, are quite good. But there is this sort of grunt guard, regular guard, who has very broad animations and his voice. He sounds like a Saturday morning cartoon henchman dog. Not like the main villain, but like, you know, 
I thought he was in a good <clears throat> Wow, that was terrible. I thought he was in a good mood. Is pretty much how it goes. And yeah, that's... Yeah. Basically, I think this is so you can very much tell. Like, it's very clear from that voice if they're angry or if they're just bored. And with the, with the broad animation, they couldn't really do much with faces. So, if he's just standing around, he's just standing around. But if he hears a noise and he wants to investigate, which is also something this game introduced, which, again, we take for granted in stealth games today, that enemies might not be on the warpath from the get-go, but they'll literally, you know, at first they will just, you know, inspect, they will literally do, like, the full, yeah, I, yeah, and, and, uh, you know, so, so, such, but it works, it doesn't distract, and you really do need to be able to tell from that. You know, if if the enemy you're looking at is is looking for something, or if he didn't hear the noise, or if he didn't see you step briefly into light, or the like. Now, to briefly address the whole gold edition, the, like I said, it, it has three levels, and these three fit in very nicely in between the others. If you know, if I hadn't looked up which they were, I probably wouldn't have been able to guess. Now, one of them is really, really infuriatingly, frustratingly, poorly done, but honestly, the other two I rather liked. If, if, you, if there's no money to save, I'd say go with the original version, and, you know, it, I'd, I'd say it's, it's okay to at least try, but Having not played the original, it would appear from researching that the original really is better. Some of the... yeah. And, and there's not a huge difference between... yeah. Now... The, the... I gotta talk about the sword, because this is another reason this game really deserves recognition is this is proper fencing. It's not like combos. It's like Prince of Persia. D except for maybe you know, Warrior Within and did. But you know, original Prince of Persia, 89 version, the like. You you'll you'll block, you'll do you know, sword strikes. You and your opponents can you know even the weakest and or stupidest enemy in this game will block and or dodge your attacks. I'm not going to say which ones those enemies are, but the first time you see it, you, you, your jaw might drop, because it really is just some kind of mind-blowing... It's, it's not something I've seen in a lot of games, but, but anyway, yeah. It's not that, you know, so, some enemies are like, you know, oh, this, this guy can take a lot... You know, no enemy is, like, immune. It's not that... BS of, you know, oh, I gotta wait for him to finish his combo, and then, oh, wait, there's, now is my window to attack, and just, you know, some are fiendishly good at blocking and then attacking, or block a lot, or attack a lot, but no one can, you know, just constantly, yeah, so, so, they do that very well, and if you, you know, if you just want to run through the game fencing a bunch of, the, you, you kind of can do that a lot. But again, keep in mind, you take a lot of damage, and, you know, everyone you encounter who has any kind of fencing weapon can fence. You know, they tend to be fighters, they tend to be there to guard something, so they're, you know, it's not like, yeah, they're there to stop you. Now, I may have already mentioned that you can also knock out some people. The sword will obviously kill, and the, the if, if you are unnoticed when you use it, you can use just one blow to, I think it's called the backstab. It is not, there's not an actual animation of a backstab, but yeah, you can actually kill someone with just one strike, which, again, makes sense. You know, if, if they're not prepared, if they're not trying to avoid you hitting them, then yeah. Now, the, to knock out 
however you use the blackjack, which is basically like, I don't know if it's metal, I, I think it is, because you can also block with it somehow. It's basically like a, a nightstick kind of little thing, and yeah, you just, you know, hit them with that. Now, regardless of how many hits it might take, it will eventually knock the, you know, the photo out. If you haven't been noticed and you just use it, especially if you draw it back, you, with, with both the blackjack and the sword, you can, like, draw it back to do an especially hard blow, which obviously leaves you very exposed while you're, you know, raising it. That will take out the, the enemy with the one blow. If they've noticed you, again, it's not just going to take the one. In fact, in that case, you might want to change the sword, depending on the circumstances. Now, the... I will say that the near the end, the game takes quite... It, it spikes in difficulty, and I personally found it very frustrating, and I can imagine others will as well. And frankly, the game does okay at the, the climax being satisfying. The, the story conclusion is satisfying, but the actual climax, like, like I've already mentioned, thieving is not the most act sneaking is not the most active way to, which, again, why stealth games, you know, at times at least, opt for a more action-packed finale. And in this, it just, yeah, it's, it's not bad, and it definitely is, you know, challenging in the right way. Like, like I said, the, the, the spike, once you get used to it, you can keep playing, but I still would have preferred that it didn't quite so suddenly, yeah. Now, the... I suppose that pretty much... Now, I, I've already somewhat explained this, but I really should put the term emergent gameplay to it. Like I already said, you can basically, you can kill your way out of a situation, you know. If, the, yeah, the game doesn't penalize you if you get spotted. You know, usually, there are a few times where it's directly, you know, you really cannot be spotted. And it tends to make sense, but it's not like, with you know, I promise I will make this my one dig at the Assassin's Creed franchise. But in Assassin's Creed, at times, you have to sneak and not be spotted, and it doesn't necessarily make sense, and you weren't even really told that you have to avoid being spotted. In this, it makes sense and or, again, you can, you can fix it. You know, you can, you can take out the guards who noticed you, and then hide them. You know, it's, it's not as, you know, consequence-free as Assassin's Creed, where it's extremely easy to fence your way out of a situation and you can just take out everyone without any problem. If you, if you have more than one guard, uh, one guard can take you out. I'm not kidding, and this can be... If you, in the very first level, just run into a guard and you just try to, you know, take him out, like, if you come straight from the training mission where you just fence and I don't think you can take any damage in that... It, yeah, if, if you just try to fence, that's probably not going to work, you know, and you're not always going to be facing just one guard at a time, so, yeah, but if you do get spotted, it's not that, well, you got to do that again. No, you basically can think on your feet, you know, you can run away, you can just rush out of the, the level if you've already gotten the item you were coming for, for example, things like that, you know. It's largely non-scripted. There, there are these conversations you can eardrop on, you know, the, the... Yeah, a couple of different circumstances where you can use scripted sequences like this, you know, also eardropping. Sometimes the two guards were like talking to each other. If you sit there and listen to them talk until they're done, they might walk off in different directions, so you will need to wait for them to do that before you can just sneak past them both, or it'll be a lot easier. 
But other than that, it really is up to you. You know, how much of the level do you want to explore? It's, it's the, the pace and path is up to the player's individual choice. You, you are not rushed ahead by, you know, sudden plot-driven contrivances like, you know, again, to, to make sneaking harder or some, something you have to fight even though you didn't before. Even when the game seems to be hinting at, well, you know, you gotta fight. Nope. I was really surprised by how dedicated they were to the 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 powerful when hidden, vulnerable when exposed idea here that they were going for. And yes, that is a direct quote from one of the developers, inspired by like a submarine game or thing or something. And also, in part, Wolfenstein. Not Wolfenstein 3D, I think, but the original Wolfenstein. You can tell they, they there are some very like claustrophobic hallways in this game. Yeah, make friends with the map, or you will get lost. It can be quite labyrinthine at times. Map and compass. Anyway, yeah, you you pretty much and and the non-linear nature of the levels also. Yes, several paths to choose from. It, it is pretty much up to the, the player to a, a quite wide extent. Now, in dur during development, this basically started as a campy hack and slash. Then there was going to be a reverse King Arthur story, and then it became Thief with the yeah the the whole sneaking and this this steampunk world. You can at times tell. There are a few. I read that outright certain levels that were supposed to be for the King Arthur story, which sounds really cool, by the way. I hope that game does get made at some point. Certain levels were used for this, and at times you can kind of tell, and that's maybe also why the focus gets a little bit too much on the supernatural, and the thievery gets a little less attention and focus than it should. Excuse me. This is entirely forgivable, however, and it's still a fantastic game. And keep in mind, they, it really was a very troubled production. The, there were like people leaving the project, and it, yeah, you can read about the details, but it wasn't a walk in the park. I. It's, you don't even have to keep that in mind. If, if you don't know that and you play this game, you're probably not going to come away thinking, well, wow, that really wasn't that good. It's, it, you, you almost can't tell that it, it had so much trouble. They really did smooth out everything incredibly. Now, the, the, the cutscenes, I should go into more. Like I said, sometimes there are these text bits, also in these cutscenes, that reveal more. Like, there'll be quotes from the holy texts of the, you know, the, basically the three organizations, and you'll find out how they, you know, how they look at different things. And also their, their Yeah, but basically everything about these three factions is thought through. Like the, the animal, you know, the, the pagans, basically like the, the what's it called, the, the structure design and the, the way they talk and yeah, how, the, how they look at, at problems is, is clearly very, you know, when, when you read from the, the Hammerites, these very devout kind of, you know, there's a lot of hath and thou and hast and such. And it's very much, you know, oh, this is wrong, you know, he, he failed to, you know, this guy lied or this, you know, this guy stole. So, you know, here's the punishment and such and such. The, the pagans have really loose language, like very, very disordered language, like their grammar and the, 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 they, I, they, they add like C to the, like the, 
instead of wood, it, wood or woods, it's woodsy and yeah, just it's you you can really tell which of the three you are reading. Now, but but yes, the, these cutscenes. So they have, they'll have this quote. There'll be some briefing stuff about the actual mission where you're told where you're going, what exactly you're getting, what you can expect, you know, who is in charge of this. Like, when, when I break the guy out of the prison in the second level, it's, you know, it's the hammers who took him because, you know, he's a fence, that's illegal. So, yeah, it's, that's what's to be expected there, you know. And if you're going into a mansion, obviously it's just regular guards, so, yeah. But, but anyway, other than that, you, these cutscenes also help tell the story. And like I already mentioned, this is one of the only places the game has actual score, and the score is fantastic. I think there's also some, if you're fighting or you're running, sometimes it'll go into fast-paced music. But, but yeah, other than that, it's, it's almost all ambient sounds. These cutscenes are done using effects like silhouette and these very, you know, it, it not only does it fit with this whole, you know, in the shadows kind of thing and, and add to the, the atmosphere and mood, but it also really helps keep it from being more dated than it at all needs to be. You, you can tell, I mean, like the the resolution is of course not what we expect today, but and and some of the like face animation is a leaves a little bit to be desired. But they don't put that front and center. They are smart enough. They were smart enough to realize what they could actually do. You know, you can very much tell the difference between a video game that you know, like animation in general. That, if you watch The Lawnmower Man, you probably need ex your head examined. But also, when you look at that animation, you're like, they really thought this was good. They, they really thought that this was... Th th yes, it was impressive back then, but it looks ridiculous. And they shouldn't have put it so front and center. And that's also, you know, like early CGI films, where they have way too much CGI. And it's not subtle enough. I, I personally, even if it's, even if it's con convincing, I feel that CGI should be used to enhance. It should be, it should not be a shortcut. It should not just be a way to get to, you know, put anything you want up on the silver screen. You know, if, if, I'm not saying that animation is easy. I'm just saying it feels more tangible to an audience, to a viewing audience, if it's real life. Obviously, you know, animation takes a lot of work, and I'm, I'm saying that animation is mostly for video games where you obviously can't just film people, you know, except for those ridiculous FMV games, which, yeah, the less said about those, the better. Anyway, yeah, they, they really knew to not shine a big light on things, and it's actually, it's really eerie, because the, like, the, the, I, I think maybe some of it is rotoscoped, like some, when, when people are moving, sometimes I feel like that's rotoscoped, because it, there's, there's a bit of a contrast there, and I, I say that it's, it's noticeable, but it's not like it takes you out of it. It just makes you feel like this is very otherworldly. It feels... There's, there's just something off-putting about it. And this is not a game that is supposed to just make you, you know, look at this fictional world and think, wow, I wish I lived there. It is... It's a gruesome place, you know. And, yeah, so it, it really works to this... Yeah, and, and the cutscenes, they're, they're short and sweet, the, the storytelling is very efficient, it's, you know, character development, all of this very nicely done. Now, the... 
there is not an awful lot less to say. I suppose, in addition to being organic and all the areas connecting, some of the levels also get rather vast, so you really, like I said, if you want to explore, you can just go nuts, just look at every single little, you know, area throughout this world and you, you really will feel just the, the level of detail that they put in. Now, most of your foes in this are humanoid. That doesn't necessarily mean that they are not capable of being creepy and I, I, I'll pretty much leave that there and uh, yeah. Now, the, the game is somewhat in the moral grays, like I said, it doesn't really take a stance in the, in the big conflict of the game, and again, it's not really, yeah, like I've already talked about, neither side seems completely right or completely wrong, and you yourself are a thief, and it's not like, you know, you play Assassin's Creed, it's like, ah, oh, I'm an assassin, I kill people to make the world a better place. Garrett doesn't believe anything like that. He's just like, I gotta make a living. I know how to steal. You know, he, he's like, he grew up on the streets and learned how to steal on his own. And then he also got some training from the keepers. And yeah. Now, the... There are several points in the game that get quite surreal and... Yeah, I, I really won't give anything away about that particularly, but I will say this is the only game I can think of that literally employs not just one, but a couple of optical illusions. And I'm, they're not done by effects. They're not like, you know, CGI. It, 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 we're, we're talking like Michel Gondry kind of in-camera stuff where they'll literally use like angle or distance, the, the yeah, things to just to fool the eye and it really, and it's not just there for, you know, ah, I gotcha, it's, it's very, again, it just makes this world feel real and, and, and remind you that, that there are things in this universe, you know, again, like, you know, supernatural aspects and all, not everything in this game is, like, quite the way you maybe think it's, that there, there are things that feel otherworldly about it, and that's used very effectively. It, I mean, you have this steampunk, there, there is, like, magic and, and, you know, some technology, and it's this middle, middle ages, stuff with like stone buildings and such and at the same time they can really make you realize wow this even in this world this should not be there and that's really really effective yeah so I admire you if you actually lasted through this entire thing so yeah I, I feel like I should offer you a prize but no Please rate and comment, and hey, if you like this video, that subscribe button's just waiting for you to click it.